the Diocese of Knoxville, Tennessee. The story of the faith in this region began with the ministry of missionary priests, was sustained and nurtured by visionary bishops, and is still being written today under the leadership of its current apostle, Richard F. Sticka. Jesus, I trust in you, and that's been kind of my theme all through priesthood and maybe through my life. And Jesus, I trust in you, so it comes together. This is the story of the bishops of America, the shepherds of the past and the shepherds of today, who through their callings and ministry carry the church into the future. It's also the story of their parish, their church, the cathedral, This is The Chair, an exploration of what it means to be an apostle in America. Halfway between the Smoky Mountains to the east and the Cumberland Plateau to the west, in the midst of the great Appalachian Valley is the city of Knoxville, Tennessee, sea city of the Diocese of Knoxville. Catholicism in Tennessee has a remarkably rich and diverse history, much more so than most people think. The first Europeans to see East Tennessee were Catholic Spaniards of Hernando de Soto's expedition way back in 1540. It's known that in June of 1540, de Soto's party camped near Lookout Mountain and mass was celebrated at the site. However, de Soto and his band established no missions in the area and essentially left without a trace. The next record of Catholics in East Tennessee was not until 1673 when Louis Joliet and Father Pierre Jacques Marquette paused on their journey down the Mississippi River at the site that became Memphis. But the first permanent Catholic presence in what would become Tennessee it didn't happen until the late 17th and early 18th centuries. The Catholics had only a small presence in eastern Tennessee for much of the region's history. When Knoxville was founded in 1794, there were only a handful of Irish Catholics in the town, too few to support a resident pastor or a parish. The construction of the railroads in the 1840s spurred population growth in Knoxville, and by the 1850s, Bishop Miles of Nashville appointed the first resident priest in the town and charged him with responsibility for establishing a parish, Immaculate Conception. Knoxville's first church, Immaculate Conception, was dedicated in 1852, and Father Emmanuel Callahan was appointed its first pastor. Father Callahan was a very interesting figure. He was seen as a poet, a pastor, a missionary. And when he finally dies after his life's work in Tennessee in 1944, he leaves this tremendous legacy in Tennessee. He's probably best known as being referred to as the original circuit rider priest of East Tennessee. In the early 1900s, he would ride the circuit on his horse named Rebel, or sometimes he would take a car or a train. The Catholic population only continued to grow from the Great Depression through the 80s. As population shifts towards the South began to accelerate, the growth was especially swift in the 1960s when the Catholic population in Tennessee jumped from 77,000 to over 120,000 prompting Memphis to become its own diocese in 1970. In Knoxville, two parishes operated between 1908 and 1958. Just three decades later, an additional three parishes were added, and it soon became clear that a new diocese was needed. On May 27, 1988, His Holiness John Paul II announced the formal establishment of the Diocese of Knoxville under the Archdiocese of Louisville. The most well-known man to shepherd the diocese in its young history is Joseph Kurtz, currently the Archbishop of Louisville. Archbishop Kurtz served as Bishop of Knoxville from 1999 to 2007. Our first bishop really had the, the task of 
helping the diocese be born and, and kind of grow as a child, our second bishop kind of took us through adolescence and Bishop Sticka is walking with us into adulthood as a diocese because now we're, we're well into our maturity as a diocese and we're trying to stand on our own and, and really do those things that, that make the church vibrant and active in our community. The remarkable growth of the diocese and its promising future is perhaps best reflected in the construction of the new Sacred Heart Cathedral, which was dedicated in 2018. The cathedral project was really part of that vision of the diocese coming to maturity that we couldn't continue to have the mother church of the diocese be a building that didn't really suit the mission of the diocese. And so one of the things we, we chose to do was build a building that, that really was permanent, transcendent, and beautiful. Then when I came, uh, I wasn't even part of my, my thought process, at least in public. And what happened was this parish is our largest now, and it outgrew the, the other place. They didn't have a big facility for parish activities. And then so we threw some concepts out to the diocese, and I announced it. We had a Eucharistic Congress a number of years ago. Closing Mass was over 5,000 people, and we got 1,000 people to give feedback and then with the pastors. And, it was about a three-year process, and we came up with a design. I wanted something traditional that you would never know what year the church was built. The magnificent cathedral is a testament to the vibrancy and confidence of the local Catholic community. The cathedral church is unmistakably Roman in its design, following a traditional cruciform basilica plan topped with an impressive dome. In a region of the country with no shortage of megachurches, the diocese wanted a design that was unmistakably Catholic. We started with James McCreary Architects. James is just a genius. He, he's brilliant, and he brought a lot of great ideas to the table. We had a, a really talented building committee, and then locally we worked with Barbara McMurray Architects who are just phenomenal. Uh, and so we had a great team and everybody had a part in it. We wanted something that, that both felt like it belonged in East Tennessee, but at the same time connected us to the universal church. The building speaks to you a great tradition through the architectural ornament and through liturgical artistry program, uh, which is full of murals and decoration. The altar of sacrifice, the flooring, the side altars, each liturgical furnishing really considered with relationship to the building as a whole and their liturgical function. A really special feature that is subtle is the walls of the sanctuary. The sanctuary walls feature subtle decoration inspired by San Clemente and the Jesse tree. So these are vegetal, vines that wind up the walls of the sanctuary. Then the sanctuary is a baldacchino, so four columns topped by an octagonal roof. The featured in the dome are murals of the most sacred heart of Jesus. Below Christ, the Holy Family, and the Twelve Apostles is a register featuring windows where light pours through, so it really becomes an architectural feature along with saints shown walking in the New Eden. So there's trees and animals and vegetal life along with the saints and this light pouring in. Below the saints is a veil. And so this draped fabric reminds us of that veil between the terrestrial and celestial realms, which is lifted during the liturgy. Tennessee has three grand divisions, west, middle, and east. And it kind of corresponds to Memphis, Nashville, and Knoxville, which are now the three dioceses of Tennessee. So those, those three grand divisions of Tennessee are reflected in that mosaic as well. But then you also see the keys of the kingdom, the symbol of St. Peter. And then below that is a picture of the bishop taking this piece of marble to Rome 
for Pope Francis to bless it. And we called that the dedication stone. And so when he came back from Rome, that stone traveled through all 51 parishes of the diocese, all 10 schools, all the convents, all the, the different religious institutions of the diocese. The dedication of a cathedral is like the, the rites of initiation. So the first you bless it, so you baptize the church. Then you consecrate it with the holy oil, so you anoint it with the oil of chrism. And then you celebrate the Eucharist. So you have baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist as part of the dedication ritual. I wanted a place that was bright and open, that when a person would enter the cathedral, they would, would feel a sense of holy. And it's become a destination point. And there are many times when I'm sitting in here that a non-Catholic will come in with Catholic friends from out of town because they're proud of the cathedral. The chair in Sacred Heart Cathedral symbolizes Bishop Sticker's authority as the Apostle of Knoxville. Born July 4th, 1957 in St. Louis, Missouri. My dad was a beer bottler for Anheuser-Busch and my mom originally from, was from a small town in southern Illinois, Nashville, a, a Polish community. So they, they married in 1939 and I'm the youngest of three boys. My oldest brother, Larry, uh, died a few years ago. He was born in 1945, my brother Bob, 47 and 57. I was the surprise. So my mom's family was very poor and she was one of uh, eight children. And my father's family came from Europe. My grandfather owned a company called Stability Leather Goods. They made suitcases. But when the depression hit, he lost everything, houses and the business. So growing up with my parents, they weren't overly Catholic. They went to mass on, on the weekends. But I got involved in the, the parish like a, a normal child. You know, was a server, got to know the priest. We had great priests. My first year of high school, I went to a Augustinian Seminary High School in Holland, Michigan. It was, we had a vocation director come from, from the Augustinians in Chicago, and he was pretty cool. And so three of us went up, and we all left after the first year. So I went to Bishop DeBerg High School in St. Louis. And then after that, St. Louis University, and, and I did all the normal things, I guess. And, work side jobs and had good friends. Towards the third year of college, I had been going out with this girl for three years or so, two years, three years. Uh, I started getting the urge about vocation again. Here I decided I had to deal with this because again, I had many friends that were priests. I had faith. I went into the college seminary in St. Louis to prove that I should not be a priest. And I worked towards that, I think a little bit. I did four years of philosophy and two years, got a second bachelor's and then went on to Kenrick in St. Louis. Rick Sticker was ordained a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Louis on December 14, 1985 by Archbishop John L. May at the Cathedral Basilica in St. Louis. I was a parish priest. I worked in the vocation office. Out of the blue, I was appointed the Master of Ceremonies to the Cathedral in St. Louis. And then I was appointed the secretary to Archbishop Regali when he first came and eventually Chancellor, Vicar General. You know, when you're a Vicar General, everybody thinks you're gonna be a, a bishop someday, you know? And you gotta be careful, because it'll go to your head if, if, if you're into that stuff. I wanted just to be a parish priest. I didn't really want to be in the structure. I wanted to, to be in the fields. And so I had a broad experience. I was the coordinator for the Pope's visit when he came in 99, and I got to spend some time with him in a chapel praying, just the two of us for about a half hour. Yeah, I've been really blessed. After years of ministry in St. Louis, Pope Benedict XVI appointed Bishop Sticker as the next bishop of the Diocese of Knoxville. It was the anniversary of my first mass. So it was December 15th of 2008. And the flu had been going through our rectory. It wasn't feeling all that great. And the phone rang about 10 o'clock and I looked down, I was at my desk and I saw caller ID, it was 202, da 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 or something. Well, I was gonna let it go to voicemail. So it did. And then immediately the phone rang again. So I thought it might be something. And I was thinking, who, who do I know in DC, you know? So I answered it, and at the other end was a very strong Italian accent. And he said, uh, you know, can I speak to Monsignor Sticca? And I said, well, this is Monsignor Sticca. And the voice didn't sound familiar. Monsignor Sticca, this is Monsignor Sambi, the nuncio. Do you know why I'm calling you? And I said, to wish me a Merry Christmas. 
And he said, no, but that too. He said, yesterday, His Holiness Benedict appointed you bishop. And besides that, the Bishop of Knoxville, Tennessee, do you accept? Well, this is like the first 20 seconds, you know? And I'm getting ready to say yes, because I've never said no. And he said, but of course you have a day or two you could reflect and to pray. And I was going to say, okay, thank you. I'll do that. But of course, most people accept. So then I said, I accept. And then he says, well, now tomorrow in your own hand, in your own handwriting, you, you must send a letter to the Holy Father accepting this via the nunciature. And I said, okay. And he said, then I'll be in contact. And so I hung up the phone. I went over to the church to pray. I'm the third bishop, and all three bishops have been uh, consecrated, ordained in the uh, Civic Center, uh, the Convention Center. I was in the newest. Yeah, we had 5,500 people there, and probably a couple hundred from St. Louis, and well, I guess 35, 40 bishops. Consecrator was Cardinal Gali. I asked Archbishop Kurtz for that courtesy, and then he was a co-consecrator, and it was just a beautiful experience. I've ordained 20 priests since I've been here. Well, actually 22, but two were Glenmary. Three religious communities have moved in. A contemplative community has moved in. Now we have a, a mobile medical clinic that is totally free. We have a Sister of Mercy who's a, a physician and about 100 volunteers, and we work in cooperation with some Protestant churches. And, and there's a couple of counties that there are no Catholics yet. We're slowly sneaking in. And we're growing at a steady pace. Jesus, I trust in you. And that's been kind of my theme all through priesthood and maybe through my life. And Jesus, I trust in you. So it comes together. I have ideas and I'm, I learned early on to get the right people. And I'm like their rah-rah guy. You know, like my hobby is presidential history. And the most successful presidents are the ones who have a good uh, cabinet that reflects the country. And I have some excellent, excellent people. I often say we could run Chicago. So I don't have to worry about all the details. I follow the Ronald Reagan thing, give me the bullet points, and then behind that, give me the details. And then if I, if I want to dig into something deeper, I do. And it's been successful. It's my style. When I talk to kids, you know, I'll say, someday go talk to your mom and dad and ask them what love is. Why are your mom and dad together? Now, sometimes you got to be careful because of all the divorces and stuff. And I said, they're going to at some point tell you that they fell in love with, you, with each other. And I said, the priest does the same thing. He falls in love with the vocation, the invitation. And sometimes you can't explain it. It's deep in the heart. It just feels right. 